everybody. Welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. We are recording on the holiest of uh, military holidays. It's uh, Super Bowl Sunday, the the glorious day. I don't know, <clears throat> Nate, I don't know if you, you had this happen when you were overseas. Did you guys get a beer uh, on Super Bowl Sunday? Oh, fuck deployed? no, we did not. We got zero <laughs> alcohol the whole time I was deployed. We have a, a guest with us. We have Michael McGinnis, who is also a veteran. Um Michael, how about your uh, your your deployments uh, when you were overseas? Did you get any beer? Oh God, no! Um, not for what was? Sunday, but my platoon sergeant had like two bottles of like homebrew sent over my last deployment, and uh, I got like two sips off of one of those bottles. So that was nice. I mean, I've I've always mentioned that we do the. Uh, I think we got we got two beers on the Army birthday, and we got two beers on Super Bowl Sunday. Like two Bud Lights, and there was a fucking bored ass sergeant major who was just looking for somebody to, to to fuck that up. And of course, people were sneaking beers constantly. Then we all went home and drank homemade wine and got really shit faced. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was I was an officer, so I was the guy everybody was hiding shit from. But yeah, I no no unit sanctioned alcohol ever the entire time I was deployed. I mean, they did stuff like in garrison or like at the end of training events when you came back, but like definitely never downrange or like at NTC or anything like that. Yeah, I well, spent two years in the 82nd, so that was like the no fun league. <laughs> you're in the 82nd. It's too bad we don't have Carl around here anymore to, uh, to, to cheer you on. Yeah, our former producer, you may have heard, was 82nd. And if we ever badmouthed the division, he would jump in during the edits and be like, <laughs> it's actually the greatest division ever created. Like he would just... He would just I, I'm not that guy. Uh, I wanted to stay on jump status, but for the most part, I detested the 82nd. Yeah, it's always it's the, those major commands. It's always funny to see the people who like have have fully drank the Kool Aid, and then the people who are just like, no, fuck these people. <laughs> Well, it was weird for me because I was in an, uh, an airborne unit that wasn't part of the 82nd. And so like being in Alaska, so many people had come there and they're like, God, it's so nice to be on jump status and not be in division. And so like I totally I didn't get it until I was stationed at Bragg and I saw like, oh, that's that's why. Because like <laughs> it's basically hell if you're a regular army soldier. Oh, yeah. It, like I I recommend to like buddies that I still have. Granted, like I'm almost 40 now, but I have, I've got friends that are still thinking, well, I'm thinking about going in the army. Hey, man. Do four years early at Bragg and then never go back. Uh, just pretend like it didn't happen. <laughs> get get the benefits and get the hell out. I mean, geez. Yeah, I've uh, I, I think I I have a class that my unit wants to send me to in Bragg, and I'm I'm very curious to do it because I always hear because I, I I love going to these these bases where people are like, oh my god, it's hell on earth, it's terrible, it's god awful. But like I always go in a TDY, a temporary duty status, for like a week to do a class that's taught by a civilian, and I'm an E6, so like I never get any of those experiences, which I'm happy about. Like I went to. Uh, Fort Carson in Colorado, and people are like, "Oh my God, the division sucks." Like, well, that's fine. I'm gonna fuck up what the fourth the fourth ID is doing. I'm gonna go to this classroom over here and have a two hour lunch break. Yeah, uh, all I can say is um, when I was in uh, Michael, you may have followed the story before. I've talked a little bit of my background, but I went to SFAS, went to the Q course, and then I went up. I left the course voluntarily so I could get out of the army. But I remember being in PT at Bragg, and we were doing it for SF, but we were doing it on the parade field, like one of the big division parade fields. And I just remember being like. I just remember, I remember thinking to myself, like, if I woke up from a dream right now, I would think something had gone really horribly wrong because I'm in regular army PTs and there's an enormous 82nd division fucking sign just right above me. Yeah, Pike Field is the place where dreams go to die. Like, <laughs> we would do uh, uh, like airfield seizures. Oh, and, God. You know, hey, man, this, we're, we have to walk 12 miles after the jump and the mission. So you're like, you're out there for three or four days depending on how horribly wrong the fucking mission went. And then, you know, you, the, the mark, like the walk back from the drop zone would only be nine miles. So they're like, yeah, we're going to do a couple miles around Pike field before we go back to the company. <laughs> so you can literally see your company area and you're walking around in a circle, like an asshole. Like, <laughs> wanting to go home, And your command's just like, nah, nah, bro, it's not going to happen. We still have two more miles to walk on a track before we go back to the company. <laughs> oh my god that's that's fucking phenomenal like i love i gotta i gotta say i love stories um about how how command is just like fuck these soldiers look too happy 
Like it, it always seemed like, you know, and the joke is always what retention problem. Um, because holy shit, like just go like what, who's, who's getting combat effective that way about like, now just wander around this parade field for two more, for two more miles. And then, and then everybody gets to go back home. Yeah. I mean, what's nuts about the 82nd is you get, it's, it's hit or miss. You either get the shit command team and it doesn't matter what level it's at the company, the battalion, the brigade command. Um, you get the shit team or you get this great team. Um, when I got back from Afghanistan after my last deployment, like I had this outstanding company command team that just like tried to fight the stupid as much as they could. And, uh, my company commander was a guy named Matt Hoffman as like a, a kind of, Hey man, we're going to send you this really cool command, which he was the last Pathfinder company commander on brag. Oh, wow. Um, before they shit can the whole thing, you know, um, and when they shut it down, they didn't tell him. So like, yeah, we're going to deploy you guys forward to Afghanistan, not as a Pathfinder unit, but as a, uh, how do they put it? Uh, uh, essentially asset recovery. So like they would fly in on helicopters to help unstick trucks, uh, you know, other. Oh, vehicles. Jesus. Oh my God. You guys were tow trucks. Yeah. I mean, but that was, that was a Pathfinder unit in this. I mean, that, that's a big <laughs> deal in the airborne community, you know? So yeah, when going to a Pathfinder company is huge, and then it's like, wait, you're you're gonna be triple A for people in Afghanistan? Oh yeah. <laughs> and Captain Hoffman was pissed. So when they got back, he made major and they're like, hey man, we're 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 gonna put you on, you know, staff, da da da. He's like, no, fuck this, I'm going home. Um, <laughs> but did you find any paths? Uh no, not that I know of for Cap Hoffman. Uh I just I mean that they punished the guys at Bra- at Bragg, it's like they punish you for trying to be a good commander. Like they wanted to to really build up just these shithead, fun killing people. <laughs> yeah, I was I was it was funny because I got out of brag and everyone's like, dude, you dodged a bullet because I had already been airborne. I had to go to a, a mechanized unit for my my next rotation, and uh, I got sent to Camp Casey, Korea. I don't know if I dodged a bullet because that place fucking sucked too, but in a, in a very very different way. It was less it was less that you were you know the command was insane and more that like it just. We, we, the training was they they were like making up for the fact that you weren't deployed by making you go to training events every week and also just like soldiers hated their lives and it was like a vietnam style replacement system so like every month your formation would change so it was like i could see why some people became lifers in korea i also could see why it was like but i mean the one thing i will say is that being in an airborne unit you appreciated how much like stuff got done because ncos were on their shit and then going to that unit i was like wait a minute this is insane. Like nothing's getting done. Nobody knows what's happening. Nobody knows like this quality of soldiers' lives or anything like that because everybody just wants out of this place so badly. And uh, that was that was a perfect coda to my army career. I was like, "Yep, I'm done. I'm out of this place." <laughs> See, I started out mechanized. Um, I was at Fort Riley and uh, did a couple years there, and I was like, "I have to get the hell out of here." Um, I had no intention. Yeah, I don't blame you. I, I was off, I was offered Riley, Bliss, Hood, or Korea, and I just took Korea because like, well, it's a, a different country. It'll be something different. And um, yeah, <laughs> uh, it made me get out, which is good because I'm a civilian now, and it's awesome. Yeah, see, yeah. I, I got QMP'd, uh, unfortunately, but I was a hellion uh, as a private, and then just made some really bad life choices after Clint Lawrence uh, meeting him, and. Uh, so I, I got QMP'd, but, you know, I kind of unfucked my shit and I'm in school full time and, uh, you know, just trying, like I'm working on two degrees and it's, it's just been, I'm glad I'm out. I miss the people, but I'm glad I'm out. I don't miss the overall organization. Yeah. Let's go ahead and uh, get into why we have Michael uh, on here. Michael uh, reached out to us. We've been wanting to talk to somebody about Clint Lawrence a little bit more. Um, if, you remember we had a, I think we talked about it, God, way back, way, way back. We talked about Clint Lawrence when uh, it first came up, I think right after, it wasn't that like right after Trump and then people were like, oh, Clint Lawrence is going to try to uh, appeal to Trump to get his conviction overturned. Yeah, it was, uh, my, it was my fresh mirror you guys put out the episode. Yeah. So so it was certainly, and, and as we have put out before, um, you you do not get convicted of murder in Afghanistan lightly. Like you really have to murder somebody like you have to murder the shit out of somebody. So Nate, can you give us like a a little Nate and Michael, I guess, can you both kind of give us a recap on this on Um, on what, on what, what the crime was. And then we're going to talk, we're going to talk about what happened. 
Michael, I'll let you, you summarize it in your own words. Um, I, I, I brushed up on it, but also like all I know is what I know from reading news stories like Army Times about it. So would love to hear more about it. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is he didn't actually pull a trigger uh, on the on the kill shots. Uh, that was that was actually one of my soldiers uh, that was in the gun truck. But like he had been giving like he gave an illegal order to engage uh, unarmed uh, civilians on the battlefield. And, you know, I mean, his his greaseball lawyer. And that's exactly what I'll refer to him because he's this disgusting individual. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, he'll claim that, uh, you know, biometrics said that, you know, these people had connections to bomb makers and it's like dude try and find someone in afghanistan who has not been related to a bomb maker at some point in the last 20 plus years yeah uh, I, I would like to meet that person and shake their hand for just skating above all the you know strife in that country but um and on top of that he was charged with falsifying evidence he was charged with uh i think the falsifying evidence thing he got off on or filing a false report he got off on. Um, but I mean, there were, there were other things. He was only there three days and he managed to fuck up so bad. He's in prison. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, so as far as I understand it, um, the, the situation was that they, they, they fired on people that were civilians and it, it was questionable to begin with. But then the fact that you got caught lying makes it extremely hard to plead the case that, okay, this is the, this is a, a misunderstanding or like that the army has framed an innocent person. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is when it all went down and we got back to the cop, like I immediately went up and got in his face about it. Uh, Cause the day prior, he and I almost got into a fight moving on to the objective uh, for another patrol. Cause he was an idiot. Uh, he might have been one of the least prepared lieutenants that I had ever met. And I was in the infantry for 16 years, you know? So that's saying something. Yeah. So, so could you talk us through like how it went down, like with uh, the situation with, with the shooting? Cause I mean, I, I, I just want to like paint a picture if I could. Well, we, we pushed, we woke up or the, the, the day prior, we went on like a midday mission. Okay. And you got to keep in mind the Fort Brigade 82nd's last deployment was one of the most top down driven deployments you've probably ever seen. Uh, the brigade commander, a uh, guy by the name of Brian Menace just wanted to control everything. So every team leader had one of those Garmin Fortrexes. And after every plat- every patrol, you had to upload the, your walk data all the way to brigade. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, so, he, wait a minute. What, what is walk data? Like all like the, like the, the routes you guys took on your patrols? Yes. I mean, okay. that, that's exactly what they wanted. He wanted time. He wanted distance. Like every patrol had to be eight hours. It was non-negotiable. It had to be eight hours. Um, and for us, some of the older NCOs, you know, we would talk to like the brigade operations sergeant major. Or, like I was in four seven three cab, so we had you know squadron commander, squadron sergeant major, and uh, you know we would ask like, why are we patrolling to time and not to standard, you know, type thing? And uh, you know, we were essentially told to shut the fuck up and get back in the box, you know. Yeah. Um, but. So we we did this like midday patrol and, uh, you know, we got back and we got, you know, uh, a heads up from our, our uh, troop commander, Captain Swanson, you know, hey, you guys need to be pre- prepared to patrol tomorrow morning uh, before the sun comes up. That way you can catch everybody coming into the village. Right. Because, um, uh, you know, when when it's too hot, people just kind of like hunker down and don't do anything. So just. Go there when the, as the sun's coming up, catch everybody, tell them, hey, we're having a, a Shura on Friday. You know, this big meeting, you know, Captain Swanson will come down. We'll, we'll see what we can do for the area, that type of thing. And, I, you know, a Roger, sir, not an issue. So, I, like, I would split my gun teams up. One team would walk and the other team would uh, either stay on the cop or they would be out in a vehicle. You know, that way they're not doing both this amount of patrols every day. And so I told the guys, you know, get your ready bags packed. Um, you know, we lucked out and actually got a Gustav on this deployment. So, you know, I carried two goose rounds and, you know, we just had our, our like we carried those medium rocks, Nate. I don't know if you carried those. I, I, I all I can remember is either the, the full ruck or the, um, the, what's it called? The salt packs. So it may have been something yet. Yeah. The, the medium rocks were essentially 
a little larger than an assault pack with a flexible frame on it. it okay, gotcha. Rather, they're really nice. So you could like pack more in there without feeling like you're dying. Yeah. Um, but you know, we always had our bags ready, you know, and then we had, you know, the night before go to bed, I wake everybody up early. Uh, I was a big proponent of forced hydration before we went out. So you got four bottles of water in you before we stepped, you know, smoke your cigarettes, throw a dip in. And Lawrence came up to me that morning and was like, Hey, we have a change in the rules of engagement. And I was like, Oh, okay, cool. Um, and he goes, anybody on a motorcycle is fair game. And I was like, wait, uh, that, you know, it didn't sound right. Cause everybody yeah. in Afghanistan travels on a fucking right. motorcycle. Yeah. Like it's, if you're not on a donkey, you're on a motorcycle. Yeah. So I asked him, you know, and I, I asked him, I, you know, where did this information come from? Because I would like to know, uh, before we go stepping off into, you know, a, a shit show. Uh, and he go, you know, it started out with, well, brigade told me, and then it was, well, we got the information from the Kandak commander who called the, the Afghan squad that was with us. Yeah. Well, he had been there for three days and didn't know these guys well enough to know that they had a medic that spoke better English than we did. Um, like a very clipped British accent and everything. But he spent two years like bouncing around like Sandhurst and like a, a combat trauma unit, you know, and all this other stuff. So I went up and asked him. Uh, his name was Sharif. And I was like, hey, man, did you get a call from the Canac commander to change the rules of engagement? It's like, dude, I haven't talked to the Canac commander in like two months. You know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, OK. So I went back to my boys in boat, you know, that were going to be in the vehicle and on foot and told them, listen, you don't take any orders to fire except for me uh, or Sergeant Ayers, who was a platoon sergeant. And, uh, you know, I went and talked to, to Lawrence right then and there, like, hey, man, like you can't just fucking change the rules of engagement uh, because, you know, I went and talked to Sharif and, uh, you know, he said he hadn't spoken to the Kandak commander in months, you know, and he essentially told me, hey, Sergeant, you know, I'm the lieutenant. Do what you're fucking told. This is the change in the rules of engagement. I'm like, yeah, well, that doesn't sound right. So I'm not going to listen to you, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do it. So, you know, I told the guys, you know, hey, just listen and be smart. And I, I lucked out. I had a really, really good weapon squad. Um, and, and they did. They listened very well. They were very smart. And the thing is, in this village that we were going to, it was maybe 200 meters from the cop. But we had this, like, shithead 2ID unit that we displaced from there who just, like, essentially put up sea wire and then did nothing else. Um, so they sea wired off all the roads. Or, you know, the, these little makeshift roads that they, you know, the army just dumped gravel on. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you had to, like, walk over the sea wire to walk through the, the fields and shit. It was just the dumbest setup ever. <laughs> um, and, you know, th this village is actually really close by. So, you know, and it, Lawrence's infinite wisdom, he'd always put the dismounted gun team all the way in the rear of the formation which I never understood because you never want your ca most casualty producing weapon system all the way. I mean, my, as an abstract impression here, I'm just sort of like that would, that seems like the machine gun and the team's going to have to run pretty far to get up to the front. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I said, Lawrence just made zero sense, like zero fucking sense. So before we move on, I got to ask, did, did the platoon sergeant say anything? Like, did he, so we, did you ask him about like, what the fuck with the, this guy saying we're changing the ROE? Yeah, I, you know, I talked to Keith. Keith and I were actually, you know, we're actually still really good friends. Um, but, uh, you know, I asked him, I'm like, what the hell's going on, dude? Like, really, what the hell's going on? And, you know, he said, you did the right thing. Just tell your boys to listen to us. OK, just tell them to listen to us. I'm yeah. like, All right, man. But I was like, you got to say something, to Lawrence, uh, because I can't have you two arguing, you know, about what the hell's going on. Because that's, that's exactly what was happening at the troop level. Our first sergeant commander lived in the same room and didn't speak to each other. They would go get a third person to relay messages through. Oh, you wow. Know? And it was, just, it was just a fucking mess, man. There's a fucking healthy command structure right there. Oh, dude, yeah. And what kills me is, is like, for a CAV squadron, we have one fewer company and with one fewer platoon in each company. Uh, but our brigade commander gave us the largest maneuver space, even though we had the fewest amount of people. Like it just the entire thing made no fucking sense. Um, but uh, so we push out, we start walking. I'm all the way in the very back and we just stop and we're in the wide open. 
like in the wide fucking open with no help. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I immediately am trying to get on the radio and Lawrence is just, you know, he was a fucking hand mic ranger, man. Like he just had like three of them. He was always on them. And I'm just trying to figure out what the hell is going on. You know, why, why are we stopped where we're at? We should at least push up to get everybody out of the open. And then, you know, I hear Lawrence on the net, uh, you know, we had a gun truck moving with us, kind of screening our movement, which had my other gun team in it. And I hear him get on the net. He's like, hey, gun truck, engage. So I immediately got on the horn. And I started screaming in the hand mic, like, do not, you know, don't fucking listen to that order. Do not comply with it. And then, oh, I, yeah. hear, and then I hear an M4 go off. And I'm like, son of a bitch, right? I can't get a hold of anybody. Keith and I are all the way in the back wondering what the fuck is going on. So I just start running up there. Yeah. And then that's when I just hear all hell break loose. And that's when the 240 from the truck, um, you know, went off. And next thing, you know, everything got real quiet. So Lawrence is sitting there. Like I said, he's, he's got three hand mics and he's on all of them. Um, <laughs> and I went to Keith. I'm like, dude, we can do one of two things. We can fucking pack up and go back to the cop or we need to get moving and make, you know, continue mission. But we can't just sit here. So he's like, all right, man. And the plan was, is that my gun, my gun team was going to detach and go get on the only intact roof in this village and just set up an overwatch. Okay. Yeah. So we had our own mine hound. We clear our path. We get up on the roof. Okay. And it wasn't until now um, that I, we kind of knew something was really fucked up. Um, because I can't, like, it's dead quiet. I always carried, uh, you know, uh, one of the more shit, not an embitter, but a. Like the Harris? No, it was actually a, a vehicle mounted radio that I, you know, you could take out. I fucking completely forgot the name of it. Y yeah, I, I, I can't. I'm mean, all thinking was the, the um, shit. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the ASIP, maybe. Yeah, the ASIP. Thank you. That, that was it. Uh, I, I, dude, I just completely brain farted that. Well, no, I mean, it's the same with me, man. It's been fucking forever, too, I guess. Yeah. But I always carried an ASIP. That way I could, I could reach out and talk to people if I needed to. So I got on, you know, I switched over to Troop. And, I, you know, a, uh, my buddy Jimmy Brandt was on the other end. And I'm like, hey, dude, are you hearing anything on, like, the Wolfhound? You know, they're picking up radio or cell phone conversations or you know, just something. Cause I'm over here by myself. And he's like, Hey man, we're not even monitoring. We we're getting word that, you know, some people got shot in town and I was like, Oh fuck. Okay. Well, that's no good. Yeah. So for me, you know, I'm on this rooftop. I see this guy right about a hundred, 105, 110 meters away behind this, this wall just pop up clear as day with a radio in front of his face. Um, and that was engagement criteria. We were allowed to engage people with radios. Um, and my gunner, a guy named Dallas Haggard, he uh, was like, hey, I saw him. Can I, can I engage? And I'm like, no, dude, just stand by. You know, let's see how this plays out. And about 400 meters out, right in this doorway, you see the guys talking to with the radio. Um, so I gave the, you know, the, the, my gun team, you know, team leader, the okay to, you know, we're clear to engage. Um, but then, you know, Carson, the, the gun team leader was like, hey, I don't know if he's really on a radio. So I picked up the hand mic, got back with Troop, and I'm like, hey, man, are you guys picking up anything on the Wolfhound? Uh, you know, which just, you know, that traced the, the radio and the cell phone communications. They're like, yeah, man, we got something like right near you. And I'm like, all right, man, well, do I have clearance to engage? And, you know, Cap Swanson, hey, man, you are clearly engaged. So we took those two dudes out. And then you see like eight other guys on motorcycles just kind of peel off and get the hell out of Dodge, right? Um, and then Keith comes walking in, you know, towards the building we were on top and, uh, you know, keep in mind, you know, in Afghanistan, you got that nice farmer's tan going, you know, your face is tan from like your elbows down is tan because you're breaking the rules and folding your sleeves all the way up <laughs> and you got the back of your neck, tan, but he just looks like pale. Um, you know, I asked him what the hell happened and he said, well, two guys got smoked and I was just like, oh shit this is not going to end well, you know? Um, and he walks back down to the other new village. And like two minutes later, he comes back and he's like, get the fuck off the roof, get your shit packed. We got to go. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, Oh fucking hell, man. Okay. Somebody really did get shit, you know, shot and killed in the village. 
and people are flexing back to kind of hit us now. Okay, so just to clarify, the shots went off. You were at the back of the formation. You didn't know what happened. You guys took a position on a roof. There you saw guys, that other people that were talking on radios, and that was clear within your ROE to engage. So at this point in the story, there's there's four people who have probably gotten hit. There's the two guys that your team took out, and then there's the two that got shot in the village. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's there's four total. Yeah. And so we pack up our shit, get off the roof, and... Like, this might have been the fastest I've ever seen people pack up weapon squad shit and get off a roof because, like, we were, like, it was lightning quick. Yeah. (laughs) Because Keith is just like, hurry the fuck up. We have to get out of here. Um, And we start moving. And we had gun trucks covering our movement. But the thing is, you know how, you guys know how it is. There's just too much maneuver space if you're just going to stay on, you know, gravel roads uh, for the enemy to get in and out. So... You know, we start taking pot shots and, uh, you know, Lawrence is trying to, you know, channel his inner patent and fight these guys off. We don't even know where the fuck we're getting shot at from. So he's just like, fuck it. We're going back to the cop. All right. That's it. We're going back to the cop. We don't have a choice in this. We have to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. So Lawrence is like, no, we're not going to do that. And Keith is like, no, we're going to fucking do that. And then I start screaming at Lawrence. I'm like, dude, get your fucking ass moving. Like, just move. Because you don't want me to, like, I was getting ready to lay hands on him again. Like I said, the day before, it literally took my other AG getting in between us for me to not hit him. Okay? Like, he just, oh my gosh, he was a horrible planner. You know, he, and that's what, as a weapon squad leader, I always appreciated good planning. If you can give me a good plan, I'm, I'm, I'm a happy camper, you know? Um, but he just was a horrible planner. Uh, he didn't communicate well. And he just came in really underprepared. And it showed. Um, so we get back into the cop and like, I probably smoked like six cigarettes and only used a lighter once. Yeah. Um, and after the last one, I go into this little, like we finally got tents like a couple weeks prior. So everybody's got like an AC tent to get into finally. And then we took one and kind of turned it into our talk. And in the front, uh, we had like a, a camera mounted on the gu- our guard towers. So whoever was on SOG could watch everything. And in the back was where Keith and Lawrence had like their, their, ho- their beds and shit. Yeah. Okay. So I go inside and my buddy Williams was on SOG and he looks at me and he's like, dude, what the fuck? Like, really, what the fuck happened? And I like, I'm dude, I don't even know. Like, I have no clue. And Lawrence comes bebopping back from this little partition. And it was like, so guys, how are we going to spin this? And I was like, dude, I'm not spinning shit, man. Like, that's not going to happen. I was like, what you did was fucking wrong. And, you know, the boss is going to know about it, period. Um, Because I don't give a fuck. uh, And you guys can make fun of me for this. But like the 82nd Kool-Aid I did drink was we did things the right fucking way. Well, yeah, and if, even if you don't believe in that, like when you know somebody's done something wrong and it's crossed over the line, like you you have one. I mean, you can you can do it because you're doing the right thing, but you also can do it because you're, I'm not going to fry for this asshole. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, my deployment before that in RC South, right outside of Kandahar, we were in the 82nd. Like I was in two five away, which was one of the infantry battalions, fourth brigade. Uh, we pushed out Jeremy Morlock's fucking unit. Yeah. Okay, so we had to deal with that blowback. My my previous my, the previous deployment that my unit was on when they went to Iraq when right I got there right after they came back they had to do go to prison for ten years for shooting a detainee on orders from his squad leader and the squad leader didn't go to prison but the guy did so like I saw what that was like like if you're in a situation you you can't you do the wrong thing they're gonna fucking come down on you it might not be the boss who gets it but you will yeah you know and I just we don't shoot civilians that's not what we fucking do in the eighty second you know like we like I said like I. I really believe that down in my bones. You know, we did things the right way. So Lawrence was like, well, what does this mean? I'm like, dude, it means you're going to fucking go to jail. It's that simple. Um, And like before we deployed, Colonel Menace just was sending bodies down to us uh, because he had this authorization from the army to expand the size of these cab platoons to what he called coin platoons. Mm -hmm. So one of my gunners was a 13 Bravo. The platoon RTO was an 88 Mike. One of my ammo bearers was a fucking 11 Charlie. Like we just had all these, like he was just throwing bodies at us. 
I'm going to pause just to, for some of our listeners aren't military. So you're saying one of your guys was an artilleryman. One of your guys was a fucking heavy crew driver. One of your guys was a mortarman. Like they weren't light infantry. No, they weren't. They weren't. Um, and that's just because whatever they got down at repo, they would. Here you yeah, go, man. You got yep. Um, but this kid Shiloh, he was an artilleryman. Uh, got to us really overweight. And the thing is, he had been working with his uh, his team leader. A guy by the, one of my team leaders named Renoso, who was just like super fit, you know. And Shiloh was like, "Man, I'm going to reclass the infantry. I'm going to do all this. I'm going to lose this weight." So I hopped in one of our trucks, and where our our troop was was only about maybe a mile, mile and a half away. So we would just take one truck in between the cop and where Troop HQ was to like go shower or use a phone or use a computer. Uh, and I had planned after the patrol to take Shiloh up to go tape him. So he can get his reclass paperwork in order. So I did exactly what I fucking planned to do, man. You know, I packed Shiloh in the truck, uh, got a driver and another person. And I'm like, hey, guys, you know, go shit, shower, shave and, you know, use the phone real quick. I got to tape Shiloh. Uh, so I went to the talk, man, at uh, where the troop was. And first sergeant asked me what the fuck happened. 10 minutes later, he's like, get everybody on that patrol here right fucking now, like right fucking now. Yeah. You know, so I made the call and, you know, we did shuttles to get everybody up there and, uh, you know, everybody, you know, fill out these sworn statements, fill out these sworn statements. Mine was like nine pages long. And he, like I said, he was only there three fucking days. Um, and captain Swanson and our troop XO Chuck Tinsley are looking through these things and Captain Swanson comes up to me and was like, did you guys make all this shit up? I said, no, sir. Uh, you know, I was like, I think you and I have worked with each other for a couple of years now that, you know, I'm not like, I may scream at you. I may call you a shithead at times, but I'm not going to lie to you. And he's like, yeah, that's what I figured. But he's like, everybody's is almost the same. And it's just really surreal that that's the case. Uh, and, you know, I told him you know, this guy just, <laughs> you know, he, physically put his hands on soldiers because they couldn't get the fucking Raven to work. Like the Raven's a piece of shit of equipment anyway. Yeah. And it's TPE, you know, through to provided. So it's not like you're bringing these back from Bragg. These have been in Afghanistan for years. Yeah. Just being passed off from unit to unit. So they're not going to fucking work nine times out of 10. Um, you know, he's, he's telling soldiers that are in the guard towers. Yeah. Shoot into the village. Um, you know, as a, as a scare tactic, you know, they need to know we need business. You know, it's just like, dude, he I don't know what he thought he was going to accomplish acting the way he did. Yeah, that's Uh, crazy. Yeah. And so next thing I know, you know, I'm getting pulled out of the platoon completely. Uh, And I'm like, they took my weapon in Afghanistan. They took my fucking weapon in Afghanistan Um, and then waited two days to give me a pistol, which really pissed me off. (laughs) Um, Jesus. Yeah. And I. They're like, hey, man, you got to go talk to this guy. And this guy happened to be a uh, reserve component CID agent who had his optic mounted on his rifle backwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, that was me, motherfucker. Don't, don't laugh at me. <laughs> right? And I walk in and, like, I have a dip in. And he's like, this is a government building. You can't use tobacco in it. And I just looked at him like, hey, dude, get fucked. You know, like, I'm not taking this out. <laughs> and he slides this charge sheet uh, over to me and it says, you know, my name with two counts of murder. And I was like, what in the fuck? And apparently a couple days prior, uh, they changed the engagement criteria from people with radios uh, were no longer, you know, that was no longer engagement criteria, but the word never got down to us. So oh, wow. I spent, I spent the last month and a half of that deployment working in the BDOC uh, staring at screens that were supposed to be hooked up to giant blimps, but the blimps never worked. So, <laughs> so, so what you're basically saying is they did the investigation and we, the two guys, you guys came and told the story about them killing the two civilians. Um, but then they have somehow turned this around at this point and, and said that you're responsible for the two guys that got shot from the, from the rooftop. Yeah. And the, what killed me is, is that we got no overhead coverage from the squadron commander or the squadron sergeant major. Um, they, what killed me is Keith and I were in the platoon for about a month and a half uh, before Lawrence got to us and things worked just fine. You know, 
Sure, there wasn't a lieutenant there, but we made it work. We conducted, you know, ran our patrols, got our missions done. No you'd, be surpri- you'd be surprised how well things work when there's not a lieutenant there. Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And the thing is, is before Lawrence got posted there, I went with uh, Captain Swanson to go see Colonel Howard, the squadron commander. You know, and we wanted a guy named Matt Colthard, who was our coist, uh, pl- you know, platoon leader. And it was like com- company operations intelligence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Colthard knew like everybody in the area. He had a good working relationship with all the locals. Um, and he was really well respected by everybody else. Um, he was an enlisted guy who then went to West Point and got commissioned through there. Uh, but, you know, we were told essentially to go fuck ourselves because Colther didn't do well on his Ranger PT uh, test and didn't get to go to school because he ran too slow. So that shows he has a lack of, you know, uh, personal accountability to do his fucking job. And I'm like, dude, I don't have a Ranger tab. I have no intention of going to Ranger school. And I've probably deployed more than you ever you know, and done more ground operations than you have, sir. I don't see what, why that's a factor uh, in, in choosing a good PO. Uh, but, you know, he told us to hey, go back to your cops, do your fucking job and shut the fuck up. And I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> you know? Well, Michael, you're obviously not in jail. So how did, how did things play out? You, you said you're in the B doc until end of deployment. And then I guess you get back, you get back to uh, the States and then, that's when all the other bullshit happens. Yeah, at Bragg, um, it, it just kind of became unglued because, you know, the shooting didn't get a lot of play at first, which I thought was kind of weird because the Bales thing happened just a little bit earlier, and that was all over the newspaper within like two fucking minutes, all right? And, uh, but when we got home, that's when it kind of got out, and it, it, it seemed like that was something people were trying to kind of like keep quiet like they didn't want to talk about it um yeah so i got back and uh i get this you know we, we get an email because god forbid your outlook has to be working by the time you get home um and hey you heirs uh and a couple of the lower enlisted soldiers need to go up to brigade to meet with the new brigade command team keep in mind menace and whoever i can't remember who the fucking brigade sergeant major was uh, they moved out as soon as we got home, like a really quick fucking brigade changeover, all that shit. And we ended up getting fucking letters of reprimand, Keith and I, because we didn't do enough to stop Lieutenant Lawrence. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I looked at I looked at this new brigade commander. and I was like, sir, were we supposed to like put him on a leash, chain him down to the center of the fob? Like, what did, what did you want us to do? Yeah, there there always seems to be like a. Uh, an implied responsibility of like a staff NCO or uh, a, a sergeant first class is like, well, why didn't you help the lieutenant more? Which like a good lieutenant comes to their NCO and says, hey, I've been in country for three days. What's the lay of the land? What should I be doing? And, you know, your NCO helps them out. Um, and it seems what y'all got was like a fucking little Napoleon came in and decided he was going to win the war all by himself through means of intimidation. And, you know, it, the thing it's it's ridiculous that somebody who's like you didn't do enough it's like i literally can't like the law states i have to do what he says if it is a if it is a lawful order like i can say no to illegal orders which you did you know and you told your guys don't you know take orders from this dude which is like literally the the best you could do is to say just don't listen to him because whatever he's going to say is probably going to be illegal and it's uh, a lot better for you to to catch a uh, you know a field article fifteen uh, for disobeying an order than it is for you to you know get up on murder. Yeah, I mean, and what what was I thought was pretty cool. Sergeant Major Faro uh, took me to his office and was like, "Hey, man, you got five minutes to say whatever the fuck you want, but at the end of that five minutes, you better be back at parade rest and remember your military bearing." <laughs> so for that five minutes, I let him have it, uh, you know. And he told me, "Listen, man." Uh, we can't we can't get it sealed anymore because, you know, this was a time when the army was, uh, you know, they, they kind of did away with the restricted file for NCOs, which I never quite understood. Um, but, uh, you know, he's like, hey, man, we'll do what we can. And I just I didn't handle any of it. Well, um, you know, we were under gag orders. We were told we couldn't speak to each other. 
And, you know, they kind of really isolated us. And I, you know, I made, like I said, man, I fucked up. I made a big mistake. Uh, you know, I got a DUI. I tried to kill myself. Um, like I just, it was rough. Uh, cause you know, you feel isolated. You, you've got this trial coming. Uh, you know, and the thing is I had like nine or 10 hours of, of a taped testimony, but because I called his attorney, you know, what he is a grease bag fucking, you know, just, he's just, a, Oh, I don't know if you guys have seen pictures of his first attorney. Guy no. just looks like a fucking scumbag. Like he just gives off that vibe, you know? So that's what I called him a scumbag attorney. And they're like, well, you, you know, you're a biased, uh, uh, your biased testimony. So we, we're not going to have you testify now. And I was like, well, son of a bitch. Okay. But they used my, you know, my Ted testimony. And then, you know, they had all the guys go in and then that's when there's the shit really got really bad. Uh, was, you know, we had people calling our house, calling our phone, uh, sending us emails about how we were like traitors and shit. And, you know, we should have helped that Lieutenant out. It was just an Afghani, you know, that, that got killed. And, you know, we're like, dude, how are you giving me shit? You know, like you were not. Did, did you, did you have any uh, information as like where that shit was coming from? Was that because of like media stuff? Well, yeah, it was, it was Alan West. Uh, Alan West. Oh, fuck's sake. Wow. That guy again. Well, it, go go figure that war crimers will stick together. I was going to say, if there's a guy who always wants to fucking... It's amazing how the army is always putting innocent people behind bars when they've committed murder, as long as Alan West is reporting on it. Like, he, I mean, he was he was the first, like, uh, you know, conservative. I, even, I think he was even out of office at this time. So he's just some fucking talking head uh, that kind of picked up that flag and ran with it. Um. Then it was fucking Duncan Hunter. Oh, Jesus. One of our favorites. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites, too. Trust me. I, I love the excoriation of Duncan Hunter on, on the one episode you guys did. I loved it. Um, <laughs> and, and then we had I had Hannity show calling me. Um, and this is after Lawrence got the was trying to get uh, an appeal done. So they sent out that biometrics expert to, like, fingerprint people and all that shit. And uh you know, so I'm talking to his producer and she's like, well, what, you know, what are, what is your response to, uh, you know, the, the information that's coming out with the biometrics. And I said, you know, I told him the same thing that I, I said earlier, good luck trying to find somebody in Afghanistan who's not related to, or didn't make bombs at some point. Like, it's just that it's been, you know, they've been fighting since the fucking seventies, man. Like everybody's been in on it. It's a family business. Um, and she didn't like that answer. You know, so I told her, I'd be like, uh, you know, I was willing to go on fucking Sean Hannity because uh, I really got tired of people like talking shit about the whole platoon. Um, but, I, you know, I told her, I was like, listen, I'm not going to come in on there if I'm just going to walk into a fucking buzzsaw uh, like I would like to be listened to. And she like his producer goes, well, I can't promise that. So I was like, well, then don't fucking worry about it. I'm not like I'm not doing this. <laughs> um, Jesus. Yeah, and then that's when Fitzy did the New York Times article to kind of give us a to give us a voice. The thing is, Fitzy was the first guy out after everything happened, so he was kind of leading the charge on our defense. You know, like trying to when people would talk shit about us on like Twitter or Facebook, it was always Fitzy because he was the first guy out. Um, the Army Times article that came out, I was the unnamed source that talked shit about Lawrence the entire time. Um, because I was still in and I don't know uh, I don't know if you guys knew but the woman who wrote the story for the Army Times her husband was in 1st Brigade 82nd okay mm -hmm. and when we got home 473 Cav became 2nd Bat 501st and was moved to 1st Brigade 82nd alright so Within probably 10 minutes of me finishing the phone call with her, I was in front of our fucking brigade public affairs officer being told under no circumstances are you to talk to anybody. Otherwise, you will be pending UCMJ. Oh, wow. So so I, I want to I want to back up just a second. So because I in case I didn't didn't catch this. So the CID guy in Afghanistan said you were going to be facing murder charges. And those 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 went away when you, you got you got a memorandum of reprimand um, from brigade when you got back. But the murder charges dropped. How did how did the dropping happen? Like, how did you find out they'd been dropped during the interview with him? 
you know, I had mentioned and keep in mind, this guy's boss was behind him to kind of make sure everything was on the up and up. Okay. Or maybe add another level. Um, but you know, I told him we were under no inclination. Like we had no idea that the rules of engagement had changed. The change never got down to us. Um, and you know, this particular agent's going through, well, did you guys check your email? Well, we don't have connectivity. Any kind of message we're sending is on a BFT through a vehicle. Yeah. We don't have connectivity. Um, well, then check your BFT. Sir, we have somebody on Radio Guard that watches the BFT and the radio uh, 24 hours a day. So if no message came in, no message came in, if, you know, if we weren't notified that way. So you can see he's starting to get flustered. Um, and, and so, and so, I mean, I would imagine they could go back and look at that if they actually wanted to and, and be like, wait, you didn't get it. Honestly, I think that's what happened is that they realized we were not notified. So how are we going to hit, you know, an element up that had no idea we changed the rules of the game halfway through? And so, so was it the last time that you saw that charge sheet? Was that in that meeting or did it come back? No, that was the last time I saw it. And I was still under the impression that I would be facing, you know, court martial and all that when I got home. Um, but I mean, it's the 82nd because, and they drag their fucking feet on everything <laughs> that they can, man. Uh, you know, well, so I didn't talk to anybody, you know, for, for months and months and months. Um, and then when I got that Gomar, I was like, well, this is great. This is like kind of salt in the wound. I'm, you know, pending charges and I got a Gomar. <laughs> Uh, but then my, like I said, Captain Hoffman, who was one of those great leaders I had, was like, no, man, you're in the clear now. Like, the Gomar was it. And I was like, well, Jesus. shit, okay. Yeah. And, and the Gomar, for, for us non, for the non-military, uh, general order... Mem- it's a general officer memorandum of administrative reprimand. Uh, sorry, I, I, had, I had to be there for friends who got Gomars. Uh, Korea is a great place to get Gomars. Uh, I never got one, but uh, I've seen it happen. So, yeah, I got really familiar yeah. with that acronym. A Gomar, a Gomar is a um, is a career killer. But if you don't give a fuck about, but it's not a go to jail. Like I've seen, I've seen you know E fives catch a Gomar and they'll never be higher than an E five, and then they just get out. So that's what that is. Yeah. So you got your you, when when that happened. When you said you got QMP'd, was that because of the Gomar? Uh, well, like I said, man, I joined the army in '99, and uh, I was a bit of a hellion. <laughs> oh, got it. Okay, yeah. Um, but that the, the Gomar is what did it. That's what kind of pushed over the edge. You know, and like I said, man, I I didn't handle things well when I got home. I fucked up and I you know, I don't I don't blame anybody for it. I don't blame the army. I don't even blame Lawrence. Uh, I really needed to get help uh, and get my shit together. <laughs> and I just I was too proud to do it, you know. Um, and when I got in trouble, when I got to DUI, you know, and I, I you know, like I said, I tried to kill myself. Uh, you know, my, I went up to Womack and I had this colonel that was like, listen, um, you know, she's seen it before, you know, people trying to job the system and, you know, she's like, do you really want to get help? And I said, listen, if you put a 20 pound bag of jelly beans in front of me and said it was going to help, I would eat 20 pounds of jelly beans. You know, I was like, I'm really just tired of feeling shitty. Yeah. Uh, So she hooked me up with a good doc, man, who, uh, Started out Vietnam as a private, and by 1983, when he retired, or you know, 84, when he retired, he was a full bird colonel. You know, so uh, he had been through, you know, similar situations. So I felt good talking to him. It felt, you know, all right, and he did, man. He, you know, he was like, "Hey, man, you know, the army's over for you, but you know, that's not life." And yeah, you know, there's a lot of good shit coming out, and you know, I still go see the guy once a week. So that's awesome. And so when the trial got at the end of it all. Lawrence got convicted. That's the story. Yeah. So he, he was convicted of murder. Yeah. 19, and, 19 years originally and general Clark knocked it down to 18. Got it. And so when you started getting hit up with the phone calls and the shit from Hannity and everything like that, was that during the trial or was that after he'd been convicted? That was before, during and after, uh, okay. Hannity, Hannity was hitting me up pretty bad during the appeal. Uh, because you know, well, it's an appeal. A uh, new president, you know, that type of thing. Um, well, you know, and it, it's been out there. People can see this. And, you know, Hannity likes to talk, like, bring, he brings it up every couple months. as like, so he can bang some kind of fucking drum about how politicians are ruining the military, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. 
And I notice it too with with Goldstein and things like that. That um, you know, other people who have committed murders, uh, like there seems to be a charge recently to like get these people in the public conversation because the thought is that Trump will will commute their sentences or pardon them. Yeah, and what what really brought these assholes back out of the woodwork was when dickhead you know major decide he's going to commit a war crime, and you know asshole in chief is like, well, you know what? I'm going to look at pardoning him. And that immediately gave everybody the idea. Oh, maybe, he'll, maybe he was really going to pardon Clinton this time. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, so these dickheads, like literally I, I'm so over it. I'm, you know, this guy calls my phone, you know, just picture heavy breathing, like, you know, we're, we're going to get you, you know, you, you're fucked up. You're a traitor. You rolled over on your Lieutenant. And I was like, dude, just come down to North Carolina, man. Just come on down because I'm tired of dealing with you motherfuckers. And if I beat the shit out of one of you, maybe all of you will stop calling me. You know, <laughs> like, that's crazy to me. That's fucking crazy. So I was, you know, I was I was uh, in the fray with the Bergdahl story when he first came back because that was my unit. And um, I was out of the country when it happened. And so people couldn't call me. But like, yeah, the news was calling my grandparents and shit. I remember that. But like, I never got I got a little bit of of, of, of the hate mail and such, but like nothing like that. But what I remember is there is definitely a kind of personality, in my opinion, of people who like, as soon as they see a thing about a guy getting hemmed up on murder charges for a deployment, they immediately assume that it must be some kind of conspiracy. I saw it in my other unit with that kid, Evan Vila, who pulled the trigger. He wasn't supposed to. He should have said no, and he did it, and he got 10 years for it. I saw it with this guy, Michael Behenna, who murdered a dude and lied about it, also a lieutenant. I saw it with a thing with Clint Lawrence. Uh, there were a couple others floating around from like a guy in the guard who who got sent to prison. And that that's sort of like, I don't know, I feel like I want to bring that up because I wanted to like reinforce that point and then ask you the question, because this is a thing that me and Francis say all the time, that like, I know that even though people are freaked the fuck out when there's an investigation... Unless you've got just like a complete lunatic command that wants to pen, pen, pen people for whatever, like most of the time when they investigate stuff, they clear the people involved. They find mitigating circumstances. And so when I hear about a guy getting convicted for a murder downrange and the, the investigation happened downrange and the murder happened downrange and like they convict him, I'm like, that basically tells me that there was no way they could exonerate him, that they tried every route and it was like, well, sorry, I guess we have to do this because they don't want to. And let's face it, 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 it happened in the 82nd, dude. And if you've even spent six months there, you know, if the 82nd can make something go away that makes them look bad, they're going to fucking do it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I know every division's like that, but like the 82nd man is just so meticulous about their, their reputation and, you know, the mythology behind it. Like nothing could, nothing is supposed to tarnish that, you know? So if there was a way that, you know, the division commander or even the fucking RC South commander could have made this go away, he would have. Um, like I said, man, you got to think this is a couple months. This is not too much longer after the Robert Bales yeah. uh, issue, man, where he just walked into a village and just started killing everything. Um, you really, I mean, do you really think the RC South commander wants to deal with the shit? Fuck no. Well, no, I mean, like, it's, it's one of those things where I saw accidents where people were negligent and they like you know using a minesweeper they like fucked somebody's up fucked up somebody's car and like injured or killed people you know our prt that was assigned to my province they ran over a kid with a fucking like uh, like the mine roller of one of their mraps and killed him and like nobody faced charges for it you know there, there were situations in which stuff was questionable with people getting shot and like I found that they they went out of their way to clear the people. They, you know, even in a situation where a where a, an AC or a, was it um it was an AC one thirty or an A ten I can't remember strafed the wrong building in my AO and killed a bunch of civilians. Like nobody got charged for it. So it's like it seems to me that there has to be so much negligence and so much malice before the military is going to actually do it. And so whenever I see these things on Facebook, like these Alan West articles, I'm always like, uh, this is not intended for people in the military this is intended for like insane right-wing facebook uncles to share about how like obama is stabbing us in the back even though he's not president and, and, and that's what kills me is people don't realize the amount that goes into these investigations these aren't typically something that just they start on a monday and ends on a tuesday you know these go on for months and months and months yeah um they're very thorough and they're you know and i'm sorry you know i i, I don't buy into the conspiracy theory bullshit. 
only because uh, after being in the military for as long as I was, let's face it, nobody can keep their fucking mouth shut to begin with. And nobody's smart enough to do that. Like, they're just not. Like... I don't know. I just I, I, I've done investigations. I mean, I did an investigation on a kid who was found a wall after after skipping his morale leave flight home back to deployment like uh, five years prior, you know, and he had like stolen all of his TA-50 and sold it. And like I, and that's not even a big case. That's just like a routine matter. I did you know investigations on people stealing ammo, that kind of shit that took me like six or eight weeks. So I can only imagine, well, like, when I was as a captain, I can only imagine, like, the murder investigation kind of thing. They're probably bringing somebody down who's at least a captain or a major to be in charge of this, if not way higher. You know, like... The, the first one we met was major, was a major, Major Washington. Um, and then I want to say, after I moved to the BDOC, they brought in a Fulberg colonel. Um, yeah. And, I, you know, that's probably after the major turned in his preliminary 15-6 and was just like, yo, this shit is crazy. <laughs> you know, like... So, so looking back on it now, what do you, I mean, do you still, do you feel betrayed by the army? Do you feel like there's a, the organization was, was trying to fuck you? Or, I mean, it seemed like you kind of made peace with it. You admitted that like, there are some things that you did wrong too. Uh, How do you look at it now? Yeah. I mean, even when it happened, um, I didn't blame the organization as a whole. Uh, For me, it was more of why didn't the squadron level commander listened to captain, uh, you know, captain Swanson and I, when we went up and said, you know, give us Colford. Um, you know, I got it. You're Lieutenant Colonel, but it's not like we went up there demanding, you know, we, we played the, you know, the military nicety game, uh, and pointed it out that it would be better for the mission. Um, you know, he was more prepared. He's not count, you know, he's not coming out of the brigade L and O shop, you know, like, come on, dude, like, who thought that was a good fucking idea to send a brigade level LNO down? So, so to, so to, so to like translate, I, I'm just doing this to translate because a lot of our listeners aren't military. So basically, like you're saying that you're the thing that bothers you is they should have known looking at Lawrence and looking at the fact that there was a way more qualified LT, uh, or at least who had experience, that putting a brand new ass dude in the middle of a deployment who was probably showing signs of being an idiot was not a wise decision and they didn't listen. Yeah, they they didn't. Uh, that, that's exactly it. Uh, I mean, that was my that was that was probably where, if there was a level of anger I had, that's where it was was at the the squadron and the brigade level command teams because they didn't listen. Um, and then when things went bad, they tried to kind of. I mean, they essentially threw Keith and I under the bus. Um, you know, like our squadron level sergeant major was like, you know, those two ran the platoon for a month and a half. Keep in mind. We had somebody get wounded, but I mean, it's fucking Afghanistan. It happens, yeah. um, you know, but we had no major issues. The guy stayed fed. Uh, you know, we kept putting in supply requests so they can have fucking tents. Like we were, let's put it this way, we, where our cop had no structures except a wired uh, cooler, which we were very happy about. One of those, those uh, like fridges. Yeah. Um, but that was the only thing that was a hard stand structure. And we lived there three months like that. No cots, no tents, no nothing. And, and so what about Keith? I mean, I know you can't put words in his mouth, but like, how's he doing after all this? Keith, I mean, the thing is, is like, we are really tight to this day, the platoon. Um, Keith is still in. Uh, believe it, he's actually back at Bragg. Poor oh, wow. Guy. Um, but uh, he he's kind of drifted off. Uh, I mean, he started a family. So, I mean, I, I get it. Um. But other than that, there's only like two or three of us that essentially just, we, I mean, I talk to most of these guys two or three times a week still. Um, you know, I, I, I got to the platoon, there were like no NCOs, and I literally had to build this thing from the ground up. And I told them, you know, hey, we're going back to where I just left uh, from my previous deployment. It's not a nice place. It's not like Colonel Howard and Sergeant Major Gustafson were like, it's going to be an adventure, guys. You know, follow me. It's like, yeah. no, dude. You're going to RC South. That place fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> and, you know, so we all got really tight through that and they, they worked their asses off, uh, you know, the entire platoon. And, you know, so we're, we're pretty tight, but Keith, I mean, he, he shut down there for a little bit. Uh, like he, he was the one who genuinely had a, an ax to grind. Cause you know, he's a sergeant first class, uh, you know, eligible for his first look at, at first sergeant. And, you know, he got skipped over for, I think two, two lists before he finally made it. Um, and, but I mean, you, you gotta 
factor in that Gomar too. You know, they were probably beating him over the head with that shit. Yeah. You know, at the central crazy. board. So, but yeah, I mean, so, my, my issue was just with how the, the higher level command teams just didn't listen. They failed to listen and then tried to slough it off on guys like me and the platoon. Uh, because you, you know, the asshole you put in charge stepped on his dick, you know? So Francis, if you got a cap off question, I guess the one thing I wanted to ask before we closed was, uh, and then hand it over to you would be like, if you're, we got folks that listen to this show who are active duty, who are deployed, you know, who are, who are out there. What is your advice to somebody if they find themselves in a situation like this, where, you know, you've, your, 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 your choices between doing the right thing you know, saying the thing that people want to keep secret or shutting up and just like, you know, letting it blow over. Oh, fuck that. No, always stick to your guns, do the right thing. Um, I, I don't regret it at all. Um, probably the one thing I regret is not hitting him the day before the fucking, <laughs> you know, all that shit went down. Uh, because I mean, I, I didn't care. You could have been the, the fucking Pope, you know, but if you're going to do something stupid and, and try and, and change the rules, would you have no authority to do so? Yeah, of course I'm going to, you know, you need to step up and say something when something's wrong, call it out and fix it. Um, you know, I still, I try to tell my kids to do that. I do that still, you know, I go to school at this tiny school in North Carolina. So trust me, you see a lot of fucked up shit there. I and, believe uh, it, man. and, and just some of the ignorance shit, I see it. And I've, you know, to this day, I open my mouth. Like I have no qualms about doing that. And I think that soldiers need to keep that in mind. Uh, you know, command is not infallible. And a lot of times command is so far out of the loop. It's not even funny. Um, you have to fall back on what you know is right. And you got to, you know, dig in your heels on that. Yeah. I, you know, not, not to go, I mean, obvious. I, I think every NCO has some kind of story about that, or at least every NCO should, you know, I've got obviously not ones as, as exciting as this one, but you know, where, where you're supposed to dig your heels in. I mean, the whole the whole idea of being NCO is to be there for the troops that are under you. And to, you know, for me, it was always like, look, do I need to protect people from this officer? Um, and, you know, if th- that's always the question that you should be asking. Do I need to protect the guys underneath me? And uh, so that's always, uh, you know, obviously that's what that's what you tried to do michael and you know that's what every that's what every you know if you are still in if you are an nco or even if you're below like if if you're not a day one e fuzzy private you probably got somebody who's below you and you know the you should be thinking like what can i do to make sure that everybody below me is okay um from the people who are above me and that's not like i hate to say that like you should always be combative and you should always be worried about it but like you know, when you step into a place, if you've got a good command structure, like I've had great commanders and I've had, you know, I've worked with shitty majors before and I've known it's like, okay, I need to protect, I need to protect my E4 from this shitty major. Uh, I need to make sure that my E4 does not get stuck out here with the shitty major who's going to exploit him uh, and, you know, get ourselves home. And then, you know, I can also like my commander when I was in Iraq, it's fantastic. He was a great, great major. He always looked out for us and everything. And, you know, just, the, those are the things that you should be looking out for if you're if you're active duty, you know, if you're or if you're still, you know, doing this shit. It's uh, make sure, like like you said, make sure that your guys, make sure that your convictions are taken care of, and make sure that uh, your your guys are taken care of, because otherwise, because I mean, you see, like they tried to pin you with murder over some shit. Like they they have no problem, they have no problem fucking over an E four because an E four ain't shit, and the military will fuck an E four completely. Uh, or an E5 or an E6 to save a captain. Like, not a problem with that. I mean, I I had a guy, a staff sergeant named Mike Cugini when I first joined that told me, you don't challenge authority, but you always question it. Um, and I I know it kind of sounds off, but the, the way he practiced it made sense to me. And that's what I always told my soldiers. You know, and I've had sergeant majors tell me, you make good soldiers, but they're mouthy fuckers. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, you know, I believe that, you know, in the in, in the the good things about the chain of command and the, how it's supposed things are supposed to flow up and down. But I'm always going to question a leader always. Uh, you know, I want to know the why, you know, and I always told my guys, if, if, if it came down to me telling you because I said so, that means I failed. Um, <laughs> you know, like I should have a genuine answer to why we're doing this or why we're doing that or why command wants us to do this. 
Um, and I, I think that's something else that other, you know, military leaders need to start doing is asking the why, because, you know, because I said so it was a shitty fucking excuse to do anything. <laughs> no, for sure, man. All right. All right, Michael. So where, where can people find you online? Uh, I'm at the bearded cynic four, seven, three on Twitter. Um, you'll find my best, like what the fuck is going on political discourses and my love of sports and comic books as well. Right on, man. Well, thank you so much for making time for us and getting up on an early in the morning on a Sunday to record this. Oh, uh, well, I, we are a family of Patriots fans, so we were going to get up early anyway. Um, <laughs> and my kids just started getting into football. Like, especially my daughter, strangely enough, uh, really got into it in the last probably month or so. So she's been eating since 6 a.m., like all the game day food. So you got to get up early to deflate those footballs, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you're not cheating, you're not trying, all right? I was going to say, I'm, 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 I'm from Indianapolis, so I'm just going to stay out of this one. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, we will get, Guys, uh, make sure you can uh, follow me at Army Strength, follow Nate at In These Deserts, Get us on the Patreon at patreon.com slash hell of a way to die. Um, we will have Michael's contact information or his Twitter, at least down in the uh, uh, down below. Uh, definitely give him a follow. He's got a lot of good. He's got a lot of good content. So and, and he's a veteran. So if you don't do it, you're not supporting the troops. So <laughs> those troops. don't be that guy. All right, Michael. Thank you so much. Hey, take it easy, guys. Mm-hmm.